Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 21, Athletics and the Panhellenic Games. The ease with which poets, thinkers, artists, and ideas moved from city to city across the wide expanse of the Mediterranean is a token of how culturally unified the Greek world was, even as it remained politically divided and Panhellenic gatherings played the most important role in shaping the concept of the cultural unity of the Greeks. Their contests and rituals fostered the idea of Greekness, of sharing the same language, religion, customs, and values. Indeed, they had the avowed purpose of knitting together the Greeks in peaceful celebration. These friendly competitions were regularly attended by the Greek elites and served to strengthen ties with both the home cities and were much about Greek politics, religion, and culture as they were of athletic skill. In fact, during the celebration of the games, a common truce was enacted called ekakaria, which literally means laying down of the arms, stating that warring states were forbidden from fighting during these events so that the athletes and spectators could travel to and from the game safely. Also, legal disputes stopped, and death penalties were forbidden. Three runners, known as Spondophoroi, were sent forth to each participant city at the onset of each set of games, to announce the beginning of the truce. The truce lasted up to three months, and for the most part, was observed. Thucydides writes of a situation once when the Spartans were disqualified from competing, and were fined for assaulting a nearby town, during the period of Ekakaria. Furthermore, new alliances were often announced during the ceremonies. Religiously, priests offered elaborate sacrifices to the gods, and culturally, sculptors and poets also gathered at the games to display their works to patrons. The Olympic Games evolved into the most influential athletic and cultural stage in ancient Greece, and arguably in the ancient world. Only free-born Greeks, however, could participate. And beyond that, it was only those who are wealthy enough to spend the time to become outstanding athletes. Not those farmers who spent all their time just surviving. Although victories brought glory for their city-state, these men competed as individuals, not as national representatives on teams, as in the modern Olympic Games. The emphasis on physical prowess and fitness, competition, and public recognition by other men as winners corresponded to the ideal of Greek masculine identity based on the virtue and fame that was inspired by the legends of the Homeric warrior kings. Thus, the games kept alive the ancient ideal of the individual hero, that is to be declared the Aristos, or best, by gaining victory over a worthy opponent. The content and the spirit of the Olympic Games had changed little from the games described in the Iliad. The event still tested speed, strength, dexterity, and endurance, precisely the qualities desired in a Homeric warrior. To us, the Olympic Games are a series of sporting events, but for the first thousand years of their history, they were part of what was primarily a religious occasion. The focal point of Olympia was the altar to Zeus, and this was flanked by his temple on one side and by the temple of his wife Hera on the other. Even fines on athletes who broke the rules were often paid in the form of statues of Zeus. In fact, a whole line of them stood on the north side of the enclosure. And once the Games started, Around half of the overall activities of the festival were devoted to religious activities. This combination of religion and athletics may seem odd to us, but it was not strange to the Greeks, for at least three reasons. First, funeral games at the burial of heroes were traditional. For example, Homer describes those for Patrocles in the Iliad. Athletics were therefore linked with the spirits of the dead and the deities of the underworld, and this was easily extended. Secondly, Skill and achievement of any kind were a proper offering to the gods. The gods were thought of as graceful, powerful beings, and they would naturally appreciate these qualities in men. Thirdly, the whole of Greek society was marked by competitiveness. Since religion was associated with most areas of Greek life, it was inevitable that competitiveness, too, should be linked with religion. The Helena Dokai were the judges of the Olympic Games. Originally, There was only one judge, 
but it eventually expanded to 12. They were elected from the ruling families of Ellis, as the nearby polis of Ellis was in charge of running the festival, and their post only lasted for one Olympics. In the 10 months preceding the Games, the newly elected judges lived in a special building in Ellis, called the Hela no Dokayon, where they were trained by the Noma Phalekes, meaning guardians of the law, in the rules and regulations of the Olympic Games. They also supervised the training of the athletes, selecting those who were well-trained and rejecting those who were not performing at a satisfactory level. The trainers for the individual athletes had to be present, but could not intervene or they were punished accordingly. They evaluated each athlete on behavior, character, and morality, as well as the more standard attributes such as power, stamina, and resistance. It seems that only young people were allowed to participate, as Plutarch relates that one young man was rejected for seeming too mature, and only after his male lover vouched for his youth, with the king of Sparta, was he permitted to participate. In any event, those that were approved were entered into a special list, called the Lucoma. Two days before the games, the athletes which were eligible left Ellis for Olympia, in a procession led by the Helena Dokai. Before being able to participate, however, every athlete had to take an oath in front of the statue of Zeus, saying that he had been in training for at least 10 months. Originally, athletes competed wearing loincloths, covering their genitals. But this item of clothing was eventually phased out, and in a rare departure from the ancient Mediterranean tradition against public nakedness, Greek athletes competed in the nude. Hence the word gymnasium, from the Greek word gumnos, meaning naked. This was introduced in 720 BC, either by Orsippus of Megara or Ancanthus of Sparta, with different accounts from Pausanias, for the former, and Thucydides, for the latter. Regardless, one of them became the first of all Greeks to be crowned victor naked, and thus the practice was adopted from there on out. The athletes competed nude, not only because the weather was really hot, as the games were held in late summer, but also as a celebration of the human body. Olive oil was used by the competitors, not only as a substitute for soap for washing, bathing, and cleansing, but also as a natural cosmetic to keep the skin smooth and provide an appealing look for the participants. It was also extremely effective in limiting your opponent's grip in the combat competitions. If you want to imagine how effective olive oil can be, gather a group of your friends, strip down naked, slather each other up with olive oil, and try to wrestle and see how effective you are at grabbing a hold of each other. I'm just going to leave it at that. Admission to the games was free, but because men competed nude, married women were forbidden to attend under the penalty of being thrown to death from the cliffs of Mount Tepeon. Women not yet married could attend, however. One lady, who did so in disguise as a trainer to watch her son compete, gave herself away when she leapt over the fence in her excitement upon his victory. But according to Pausanias, the judges let her off, out of respect for her father, her brothers, and her son, all of whom were Olympic victors. But afterwards, they made a law for the future that trainers too should enter the arena naked. In any event, the first games lasted only one day, and consisted of only a single event, a foot race of between 180 to 240 meters, called the Stadion, and named after the building in which it took place. The word became stadium in Latin, from which we get our word stadium. In fact, there were seats for the judges and embankments all around for the spectators. The length of the race is uncertain, since tracks found at Olympia and other archaeological sites, as well as literary evidence, provides conflicting measurements. Regardless, runners had to pass five stakes. One stake at the start, another at the finish, and three in between. They probably competed in heats, with the winners of each heat going on to the championship round. Each race began with a trumpet blow, with officials at the starting blocks to make sure there were no false starts. There were also officials at the end to decide on a winner and to make sure nobody had cheated. Since there were no drawn-out lanes, like in modern times, obstruction probably occurred. If the officials decided there was a tie, the race would be rerun. Runners started the race from a standing position, probably with their arms stretched out in front of them, instead of starting in a crouch, like modern runners. They ran on a packed earth track that had been broken up by pickaxes and covered with a deep layer of sand. By the 5th century BC, the track was marked by a marble stone starting block, known as the balbus, that had a set of double grooves in which the runner places his toes in order to give him leverage for a start. 
Over time, other events were added, but the winner of the Stadion was still considered the most prestigious and was the first listed in the list of victors. The Diolis, or two Stadion race, was introduced in 724 BC. It literally means double pipe and was a single lap around the stadium, approximately 400 meters. Since the track made a hairpin turn at the end of the stadium, there was a turning post, called a camp tur, at each end of the track to assist the sprinters in making the tight turn for the return leg of the race. Scholars debate whether or not the runners had individual camp terres, or whether all the runners approached a common post, turned, and then raced back to the starting line. A third foot race, the Dolikos, was introduced four years later in 720 BC. There is conflicting evidence as to the length of the race, but it was between 18 to 24 laps, or about 5 kilometers. The runners would begin and end their event in the stadium, but the race course would wind its way through the Olympic grounds. The course often would flank important shrines and statues in the sanctuary. Wrestling, called Pele, was added in 708 BC, and was the first competition to be added that was not a foot race. The competitions were held in elimination tournament style until one wrestler was crowned the victor. There were no weight classes, and opponents were chosen through random drawings. The wrestling area was held in a sand pit outside the Temple of Zeus, and the area was one square plethron, which was about 100 feet, and was the typical width of a running track. These were the rules of ancient Pele. No intentional hitting, kicking, gouging of the eyes, biting, or grasping of the genitals was permitted. It was at the discretion of the referee whether or not twisting the fingers with the intention of forcing the opponent to concede defeat was permitted. All other holds intended to persuade the opponent to concede defeat through pain or fear were permitted and were an integral part of the match. Infractions were punished by immediate whipping by the referee until the undesirable behavior stopped. Three points had to be scored to win the match. A point was scored when your opponent touched the ground with his back, hip, or shoulder. He conceded defeat by tapping due to a submission hold, or he was forced out of the allocated wrestling area. Wrestling was regarded as the best expression of strength out of all of the competitions. The pentathlon was also added in 708 BC. Its name is derived from the Greek words pente, meaning five, and athlon, meaning competition and thus consisted of five events over one day. The first three events were called the triagmos, which consisted of the long jump, javelin throw, and discus throw. Their exact order is unclear, but they were followed by the stadion foot race, and finally wrestling. The first four events were held in the stadium, and wrestling took place in the normal sand pit area outside the Temple of Zeus. In later times, the stadion race was occasionally replaced by boxing or pancration, more on those two very shortly. Unlike modern track meets, the events of the Triagmos did not appear as individual events outside of the pentathlon format. Competitors in the Triagmos were allowed five discus throws, five javelin throws, and five long jumps each, and only their best distance counted. The discus throw had essentially the same basic format as its modern version, although the actual technique and rules may have differed. However, the discus which was nine pounds of solid bronze, was thrown from a raised platform rather than on a level field. The javelin throw used a leather strap, called an ankele, rather than having the athlete grip the shaft of the javelin instead. When the javelin was released, the strap unwound, giving the javelin a spiraled flight, and thus probably increased the distance. The javelin, like the discus, was thrown for length, but in addition, there was a second section of it where they threw for accuracy. The javelin was a lighter, longer version of a war spear. The Eka Bolon was the event won by distance. The Stochasticon was the event based on accuracy. The long jump is perhaps the most unusual, compared to the modern version. A long jumper was aided by the use of halteres, which were stone weights that the athletes would hold and swing to help propel themselves further. It probably aided in lengthening the jump through momentum or achieving a cleaner landing. His jump probably consisted of five separate leaps, more like the modern triple jump, which is a hop, skip, and then a jump. This is the hypothesis that actually created the triple jump, because distances of long jump victors have been recorded to regularly reach over 50 feet, 
which is almost impossible with modern techniques, even with weights for momentum. The world record for long jump at this moment is only 29 feet. The triple jump is 60 feet, hence the hypothesis. It is unclear how a winner was chosen, but there are many theories that circulate. The first, and most unlikely, is that in order to be proclaimed the victor, a competitor must win all five of the events. This method is impractical, for the prize would have hardly ever been awarded. Another hypothesis is that perhaps an athlete that was victorious in just three events was declared the overall winner. One of the more common theories is that only a certain amount of competitors would qualify for the final event, wrestling, based on their performance in the previous four events. Ultimately, the victor of wrestling would be deemed the champion of the entire pentathlon. In any event, pentathletes were considered to be among the most skilled athletes, and their training was often part of military service, as each of the five events in the pentathlon was thought to be useful in war or battle. The wide variety of skills needed to compete meant that pentathletes were held in high esteem as physical specimens. In his rhetoric, Aristotle remarked, A body capable of enduring all efforts, either of the race course or of bodily strength. This is why the athletes in the pentathlon are the most beautiful. Boxing, or pygmachia, which literally means fist fighting, was added in 688 BC. It dates back to at least the 8th century BC, as it took place in the Iliad. One legend holds that Theseus invented a form of boxing in which two men sat face to face and beat each other with their fists until one of them was killed. Regardless, the extent sources about ancient Greek boxing are fragmentary or legendary, making it difficult to reconstruct its rules, customs, and history in great detail. Still, it is clear that gloved boxing bouts became increasingly brutal over the centuries. Participants trained on punching bags, called a karikos, that were filled with sand or flour. Initially, soft straps made of oxhide, called himantes, were wrapped around their hands and knuckles several times, leaving their fingers free. But in the 5th century BC, the sphyri were introduced. Very similar to the himantes, except that the exterior was much harder and sometimes metal was added in order to facilitate greater damage. They also wrapped up their wrists and forearms sometimes with a leather band, called oxus, for greater support when punching. There was no protection for the face or head though. As you can see, their protection was not like ours today, and indeed, probably caused more damage than just a naked fist would have done. Also, open-handed blows were also allowed. There were no weight classes, and opponents were chosen through random drawings. The fights had no rounds, no time limits, no rest periods, and no rules against hitting a man while he was down. Bouts continued until one man either surrendered or died. In the event of any deaths, it was legally treated as an accident and not manslaughter. Chariot racing, or harmatodromia, was introduced in 680 BC. It is unknown exactly when chariot racing began, but it also is described in the Iliad, taking place at the funeral games of Patrocles. As we described in episode 10, a chariot race won by Pelops also was said to have been the event that founded the Olympic Games, though it was not in reality the founding event. Although chariots were no longer used in battle, chariot racing at the games was a way for the Greeks to continue to demonstrate their power and prosperity to the Greek world. It may not have been as prestigious as the stadion, but the winner of one of the two chariot races, either the four-horse race, called the Tethrippon, or the two-horse race, called the Sinoris, was highly acclaimed. The chariots themselves were essentially wooden carts with two wheels and an open back. The charioteer's feet were held in place, but the cart rested on the axle, so the ride was bumpy. Although chariot racing was dangerous to both charioteer and horses, as they often suffered serious injury and even death, driving a chariot required unusual strength, skill, and courage. However, it was not the charioteer, but the owner of the chariot who was considered to be the competitor, so one owner could win more than one of the top spots. The charioteer was usually a slave or hired professional. Unlike the other Olympic events, the charioteers did not perform in the nude, however, and it was probably for safety reasons, because of the dust that would have kicked up during the race and the likelihood of violent, bloody crashes. 
In any event, charioteers wore a sleeved garment called a zistus. It fell to the ankles and was fastened high at the waist with a plain belt. Thus, since they were clothed, all women were allowed to watch this event. Furthermore, women technically could be winners of the race through ownership. Single horse races, called keles, were added later in 648 BC. The difficulties of the jockey, who rode on the horseback and without stirrups, can be easily imagined. Once again, it was the owner of the horse who would be considered the victor, not the jockey whose skill and courage had brought the victory. Each horse race, whether chariot or a single rider, began by a procession into the Hippodrome, while a herald announced the names of the riders and the owners. The Hippodrome literally means horse course, from the Greek words hippos, horse, and dromos, course. The Hippodrome of Olympia was situated at the southeast corner of the sanctuary, on the large flat area south of the stadium that ran almost parallel to it. Although it is still buried underground, the use of radar has recently located its existence, and excavations are still in process. In any event, it was a large, elongated race course, measuring 780 meters long and 320 meters wide. It was surrounded by both natural and artificially made banks on all four sides for the spectators. A special place was reserved for the judges on the west side of the north bank. It was divided vertically into two tracks by a stone or wooden barrier down the center, called the Embalon. All the horses or chariots ran on one track toward the east, then made a 180 degree turn around the Embalon and headed back west. Distances varied according to the event. The Tethrapone, with four horses, for example, consisted of 12 laps around the Hippodrome, while the Sonoris, with two horses, did nine. Various mechanical devices were used, including the starting gates, called Hispleges, which were lowered to start the race. According to Pausanias, these were staggered so that the chariots on the outside began the race earlier than those on the inside. The race did not begin properly until the final gate was opened, at which point each chariot would be more or less lined up alongside each other, although the ones that had started on the outside would have been traveling faster than the ones in the middle. Other mechanical devices, known as the eagle and the dolphin, were raised to signify that the race had begun, and were lowered as the race went on to signify the number of laps remaining. These were probably bronze carvings of those animals, set up on posts at the starting line. The most exciting part of the chariot race, at least for the spectators, was the turns at the ends of the hippodrome. These turns were very dangerous and often deadly. If a chariot had not already been knocked over by an opponent before the turn, it might be overturned or crushed, along with the horses and driver, by the other chariots as they went around the post. Deliberately cutting in front of or running into an opponent to cause him to crash was technically illegal but nothing could be done about it, and crashes were likely to happen by accident anyway. For instance, the 5th century BC lyric poet Pindar tells us about a winner of one particular race, whose chariot was the sole finisher of 41 total competitors. Thus, the dangerousness of this event made it one of the most popular events for the spectators. Pancration was also introduced in 648 BC. It was a fighting combination that combined elements from both wrestling and boxing, as well as other types of kicking, holds, locks, and chokes on the ground, very similar to today's mixed martial arts competitions. It was a violent, anything-goes type of fight, except for eye gouging and biting. Pankration literally means all of your might, from the Greek words pan, or all, and kratos, strength, might, or power. It was also sometimes referred to as pamakion, or total combat, from pan and make, meaning combat. In Greek myth, Heracles and Theseus were said to have invented pankration as a result of their physical confrontations with their various opponents. However, it more than likely came about as a method for training for Greek soldiers, who needed to be effective hand-to-hand -hand combatants once their spears broke in the phalanx. Like boxing and wrestling, there were neither weight divisions nor time limits in Pankration competitions. The contest itself usually continued uninterrupted until one of the combatants submitted, which was often signaled by the submitting contestant raising his index finger. Although knockouts did occur, most Pankration competitions were decided on the ground, 
where both striking and submission techniques would freely come into play. Pankratiasts were highly skilled grapplers and were extremely effective in applying a variety of takedowns, chokes, and joint locks. In extreme cases, a Pankration competition could even result in the death of one of the opponents. Pausanias describes a statue he saw of one Pankratis who, as he put it, fought his last remaining rival for the wild olive. This opponent, whoever he was, caught Arachion and held him with his legs in a powerful scissor scrip. At the same time, he started to throttle him with his hands. Arachion then broke one of his opponent's toes. Arachion died from the strangling, but at the same time, the strangler gave in because of the pain in his toe. The Elians crowned Arachion's corpse with the wreath and proclaimed him the winner. Furthermore, some tombstones show athletes who were disfigured after their competition. As we can see, Pankration was a vicious sport, not for the weak-hearted. Wrestling, boxing, and Pankration competitions were held in tournaments with four or five rounds, which would be a field of 16 to 32 athletes. Preliminary contests would have been held prior to the games to determine who would participate in the main event. Each tournament began with a ritual to determine the opponents. A 2nd century AD satirist named Lucian describes the process in great detail. A sacred silver urn holding bean-sized lots was brought out. On two lots, an alpha is inscribed. On two, a beta. On two, a gamma. And so forth. Each athlete comes forth, prays to Zeus, puts his hand into the urn, and draws out a lot. The athlete's hands are held so they can't read the letter they have drawn. When everyone has drawn a lot, one of the Helenodike then joins the athlete holding the alpha to the other one who has drawn the alpha, and so forth for the remaining letters. This process was apparently repeated every round until the finals. If there was an odd number of competitors, one of the lots was designated to be drawn for a bye, called Ephedros which literally means reserve. There thus was an ephedros in every round until the last one. The same athlete could be an ephedros more than once, and this could of course be of great advantage to him, as he would be spared the wear and tear of the rounds imposed on his opponents. If you won a tournament without being an ephedros in any of the rounds, you were called an anephedros, or non-reserve, and it was considered a very honorable distinction. Separate sets of contests were held at Olympia for younger boys and for women starting sometime in the early 6th century BC. The boys events, the stadion, wrestling, and boxing, were restricted to competitors aged between 12 and 18, although how the judges could be sure of the competitors' ages are not clear. But they were an important part of the Olympic Games, to judge at least from the fact that a quarter of Pindar's surviving poems are addressed to boy victors. Women, though, had their own separate games at Olympia on a different date in honor of Zeus's wife, Hera, known as the Heraean Games. Although less is known about the games of Hera, Pausanias reports that women not yet married competed in three age groups on the Olympic track in a foot race, five six as long as the men's stadion. Pausanias describes their appearance for the races, saying that their hair hangs down, a tunic, called a chitin in ancient Greek, reaches to a little above the knee, and they bear the right shoulder as far as the breast. Though the men competed nude and women dressed, chitons were clothing worn by men doing heavy physical work. Thus the women competitors were dressed like men. The Horean champions won olive crowns, ox meat from the animal sacrificed to Hera, and the right to dedicate statues inscribed with their names or painted portraits of themselves on the columns of Hera's temple. It is still apparent where the portraits were attached on the temple, though the artwork itself has disappeared. The last event at it was the Hoplitodromos, or Hoplite Race, introduced in 520 BC, and traditionally ran as the last race of the Olympic Games. The competitors would run either a single or double dialos, while carrying a shield and wearing the helmet and greaves of the Hoplite infantryman. Due to the weight of the armor, around 50 pounds, It was easy for runners to drop their shields or trip over fallen competitors, especially when negotiating the tight turn around the stadium. As the Hoplito Dromos was one of the shorter foot races, the heavy armor and shield was less a test of endurance than one of sheer muscular strength. It was as much a military training exercise 
as an athletic contest. Encounters with squads of expert Persian archers, first occurring shortly before the Hoplito Dromos was introduced, must have suggested the need for training the Greek armored infantry in fast, rushing maneuvers during combat. Additionally, the length of the Hoplito Dromos coincides well with the effective area of the Persian archer's zone of fire, suggesting an explicit military purpose for this type of training. With the addition of the Hoplito Dromos, the program of the Olympic events had reached its final form. Thereafter, there were a few short-lived innovations, like the mule cart race, and a little strangely, the addition of competitions for heralds and trumpeteers. But generally speaking, they continued for nearly 800 years unchanged. The addition of these events meant that the Olympic festival over time grew from one day to five days, three of which were used for the athletic competitions. The other two days were dedicated to religious rituals. On the first day, the sacrifice of the hundred oxen to Zeus was performed. This type of sacrifice was called hecatombe, from the Greek words hecaton, or 100, and bous, meaning bull or oxen. Also, the athletes were checked over by the judges and swore the aforementioned oaths to Zeus. On the second day, the equestrian events took place in the morning and the pentathlon in the afternoon. On the third day, religious observances were held in the morning and the younger boys' events took place in the afternoon. The fourth day was one of the more exciting ones. In the morning, at the stadium, the Stadion, Dialis, and Dolikos foot races took place with the wrestling, boxing, and pancration matches in the afternoon, followed by the Hoplito Dromos to end the athletic events. A surprising end, perhaps, but one that reflects both the emergence of the hoplite as the main defense of the state and the Greek preference for a quiet end to excitement, whether in the theater or in the stadium. On the final day, there was a banquet for all the participants, consisting of the hundred oxen that had been sacrificed to Zeus on the first day. The crowning ceremony for the victors was also a religious rite. Since the goddess Nike would crown them eternal victory, Olympic victors were considered to be divinely favored. Victors originally received no financial prizes, only a kotinos, a symbolic honor of a garland of olive leaves from the sacred temple of Zeus. But the prestige of victory could bring other rewards as well, especially in his home polis, where he was often granted triumphal processions, civic honors, and in some cases, large sums of money, after it was developed, of course. Prizes with material value could be awarded in later Greek athletic competitions, however. Sculptors would create statues of Olympic victors, and poets would sing odes in their praise for money. There were no prizes or accolades given for second and third place finishes, though. So essentially, in the ancient Olympics, if you weren't first, you were last. The traveler to the Olympic festival, though, would see much more than just athletes. Spectators came in the thousands, and with them, all sorts of people who have attended fairs in every age and country. Drink sellers, showmen, cooks, gamblers, peddlers, thieves, singers, prostitutes, traveling actors, and so forth. One later account says, Many miserable so-called teachers could be heard shouting and reviling each other around the temple while their so-called pupils fought with one another. Writers were reading their rubbish aloud. Many poets were reciting their verses to the applause of others. Many conjurers were showing off their tricks. Fortune tellers theirs. There were countless advocates perverting the law, and more than a few peddlers hawking everything and anything. Women were also present, although they were not allowed into the stadium to watch the events. Only the Hippodrome, that is. What was remarkably absent at Olympia was anything like the facilities provided nowadays at the Olympic Games. A hostel and a gymnasium were built fairly late in the history of the Games, and there were two small bathhouses, but that was it. For competitors and spectators alike, life was open air and uncomfortable. As the 1st century AD Stoic philosopher Epictetus put it, unpleasant and difficult things happen in life, but don't they happen in Olympia? Aren't you burnt by the sun? Aren't you crowded and tight-packed? Aren't you soaked to the skin whenever it rains? Don't you get more than enough noise and shouting and other unpleasantness? Still, I expect you tolerate all of this, because you offset it against the marvelous spectacle. Furthermore, 
Pausanias even speaks of the Elian sacrificing a Zeus of Pomeos, or Zeus the averter of flies, to protect Olympia. Apparently, they had a bug problem too. I've been to Olympia in July, and it's incredibly hot and uncomfortable there, even with modern amenities. One can only imagine what it was like 2,500 years ago. Regardless, Olympia and all of the Panhellenic sanctuaries increased greatly in popularity and prestige in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. Ever greater numbers of people came to worship, consult oracles, and participate in or attend musical and athletic competitions. The two biggest attractions were the sanctuaries of Zeus at Olympia and of Apollo at Delphi. By the end of the 7th century BC, the athletic games in honor of Zeus were drawing spectators and contestants to Olympia from the entire Greek world. Shortly thereafter, the Olympic Games were joined by similar new Pan-Hellenic festivals and games at other sanctuaries. The Pythian Games for Apollo at Delphi in 582 BC, following their victory in the First Sacred War. The Isthmian Games for Poseidon at Corinth in 581 BC, following their expulsion of the Kypsilid tyranny. And the Nemean Games for Zeus near Argos in 573 BC. The new games were integrated into the four-year Olympiad so that there would be one major game every year, with the Olympics remaining the premier event. The events competed in and the prizes awarded were similar to that of Olympia. Instead of the olive leaf foliage, though, victors at the Pythian Games received laurel, which was sacred to Apollo, those at Nemea, the wild celery leaf, and at Isthmia, the pine. The sacred precincts themselves became places for polis, to boast of their wealth and achievements with dedications of statues and costly stone and marble treasuries, in commemoration of contest winners or of military victories by the polis. At Delphi, administration of the Pythian Games were overseen by the Amphictyonic League. Preparations for the games began six months prior. Nine citizens from Delphi, called Theoroi, were sent to all Greek cities to announce the beginning of the games in order to attract athletes as well as to declare the period of the sacred truce, called Hieromenia, aiming at protecting not only the Theoroi and the athletes who traveled to Delphi, but also the Temple of Apollo itself. It was very similar to the sacred truce of Olympia. If Apollos violated this truce, though, it had even graver effects, because then its citizens were not only forbidden from participating at the games, but also from visiting the sanctuary and consulting the oracle the Pythian Games lasted for six to eight days and were started by the reenactment of the victory of Apollo over Python. After a glamorous procession, a ritual sacrifice was performed in the Temple of Apollo. Seen as Apollo was the god of the arts and music, at the Pythian Games there was also competitions in choral and solo poetry and in musical performances of the Aeolus and Cathara, both with or without singing. On the fifth day, the athletic events began. In addition to those performed at Olympia, there were also gymnastic competitions. The final day of the Pythian Games was dedicated to equestrian races, held in a hippodrome in the plain below the ruins of Crissa, not far from the sea. The stadion sat high above Delphi itself, up on the cliffs of Mount Parnassus, and is still visible today. Other non Pan Hellenic festivals emerged in Anatolia. Magna Graecia, and the mainland, providing the opportunity for athletes to gain fame and riches, in addition to poets and musicians. One of the largest were the Panathenaic Games in Athens, instituted in 566 by Pisistratus, but for only the Athenians. We will cover this more in greater detail when we get to the infamous tyrant. Although many other games were established, none of them equaled the Olympic Games in prestige. This is clear from the records that individual athletes published. These lists, sometimes of great length with hundreds of victories mentioned, gave their successes, but always put Olympic victories first. They also included draws at Olympia and even losses in the finals, but only for those at Olympia. That's how important Olympic Games were to the Greek mindset. As the Olympic Games became a vehicle for city-states to promote themselves, the result was political intrigue and controversy. Pausanias relays a situation when a victor named Sotades, originally from Crete, was bribed to compete for Ephesus the following games. With such prestige at stake, it is not surprising that training became very important, 
It was, of course, usually the sons of the wealthier citizens who had the time to indulge in these activities and the money to pay the trainers. But most cities were willing to help finance promising athletes. And so the net for potential winners was spread fairly wide. Trainers played a large part, and Pindar mentions them in several of his victory odes. As athletes became more professional, the athlete's diet evolved too. A Spartan winner of the Stadion in 668 BC is said to have had a special diet of dried figs. Pausanias speaks of one man who, as he put it, was so successful at the long-distance race that he won twice at Olympia, twice at the Pythian Games, three times at the Isthmian Games, and five times at Nemea. It is said that he was the first to have an all-meat diet. Until then, athletes' food had been cheese, straight from the basket. Thus, it is not surprising that these Pan-Hellenic and regional games came to be dominated by professional athletes, who made good livings from appearance fees and prizes won. The most famous athlete of all was Milo of Croton in southern Italy. Croton was especially well known for the wrestling prowess, and Milo was the best of them all. He was the winner of the Olympic wrestling crown six times every year from 540 to 520 BC. He also won seven crowns at the Pythian Games, ten at the Isthmian Games, and nine at the Nemean Games. In doing so, Milo was a five-time periodonikes, a Grand Slam sort of title bestowed upon on the winner of all four festivals in the same Olympiad. Milo's career at the highest level of competition spanned 24 years, but he was defeated, or tied, in his attempt at a seventh consecutive Olympic title in 516 BC by a young wrestler from Croton, who practiced the technique of acrocarismos, which literally means high-handedness, or wrestling at arm's length. And by doing so, he avoided Milo's crushing embrace, for which he was famous. Simple fatigue took its toll on Milo, and at that point, he more than likely retired and eventually became a pupil of Pythagoras, as we described last episode. The Greek athletes had a larger-than-life quality. At Olympia, for example, they were set apart from the general population for lengthy training periods, and they observed a complex series of prohibitions that included abstinence from intercourse. Once training was completed, and the athletes were brought before their fellow citizens, trim, fit, nude, and shimmering with oil, they must have appeared semi-divine. The reverential awe in which athletes were held in Greece led to exaggeration in the tales surrounding their lives. In Milo's case, Aristotle began the myth-making process with reports likening Milo unto Heracles. His daily diet allegedly consisted of 20 pounds of meat, 20 pounds of bread, and 18 pints of wine. And Athenaeus continued the process with the story of Milo's superhuman strength, saying that he carried his own bronze statue to its place at Olympia, and even carried on his shoulders a full-grown bull, a feat also associated with Heracles, before slaughtering it, roasting it, and devouring it whole in one day. His wrestling grip was so tight that one report says that he was able to hold a pomegranate in his hand without damaging it, while challengers tried to pry his fingers open. His balance was so impeccable that he was able to maintain his footing on an oiled up discus while others tried to push him off of it. He was also renowned for his showy stunts. During one wrestling match, he was purported to have burst a cord about his brow by simply holding his breath and thus inflating the veins of his temple. It is perhaps Milo's sudden death which makes him most akin to the heroes. There is a hint of hubris in this account, and a striking contrast between his glorious athletic achievements and his sudden ignoble death. According to tradition, Milo was walking in a forest when he came upon a tree trunk split with wedges. In what was probably intended as a display of strength, Milo inserted his hands into the cleft to rip open the tree. The wedges fell from the cleft, and the tree closed upon his hands, trapping his hands inside. Unable to free himself, Milo was eventually devoured by wolves. Of course, the system of professional athletes was criticized. As we made mention last episode, Xenophanes was foremost among them. In the 6th century BC, trying to discredit athletic prowess, he said, If a man is victorious in speed of foot, or in the pentathlon, or the precinct of Zeus, lies beside the streams of Pisa at Olympia, or in wrestling, 
or in the painful art of boxing, or in that terrible contest called the Pankration. He is looked up to with honor by his fellow citizens, and is given a high seat at festivals, and maintenance at public expense, and gifts to have as his treasure. He gets all this too if he wins with horses, but he is not as deserving as I, for my wisdom is better than the strength of men or horses. For even if a good boxer is one of the people, or a good man at the pentathlon or at wrestling, the city is no better run because of this, nor are her storehouses enriched. Aristotle later doubted the value of professional athletics for a proper education, saying, The athlete's training neither produces a good condition for the general purposes of civic life, nor does it encourage ordinary health and the procreation of children. Some amount of exertion is essential for the best state of body, but it must be neither violent nor specialized, as is the case with the athlete. It should be rather a general exertion, directed to all the activities of a free man. And Galen, the distinguished 2nd century AD doctor, complained bitterly of the malpractice of trainers, whose fraudulent art produced mindless, ugly, distorted men. But these writers were an intellectual minority. As is the case today, the ordinary people love the festivals for their atmosphere, the crowds, the entertainment, and the excitement. It may seem strange that the greatest and most glorious of all Pan-Hellenic festivals was celebrated near the western shores of the Peloponnese. One might have looked to find it nearer the Aegean, but situated where it was, the scene in the Olympic Games was all the nearer to the Greeks beyond the Western Sea, and none of the peoples of the mother country vied more eagerly or more often in the contest of Olympia than the colonists, who had found it new homes, far away on Sicilian and Italian soil. In this way, the Olympic Festival helped the colonies of the West keep in touch with the mainland, It furnished a center where Greeks of all parts met and exchanged their ideas and experiences. It was one of the institutions which expressed the consciousness of fellowship among the scattered folks of the Greek world, and it became a model for other festivals of the same kind in promoting a feeling of national unity. At the beginning of the Archaic period, the Greeks were still a relatively isolated and economically backwards people, organized politically into low-level chiefdoms. By the late 6th century BC, they had a culturally advanced state society that spread across the entire Mediterranean and were major players in the complex international market economy. The supreme political achievement of the Archaic Age Greeks was the polis, which in the course of the period evolved from narrow oligarchy to tyranny to a more broadly based polity in which the majority of its members participated in its governance. Because the people, and not just the elite, had a stake in the polis. The sense of loyalty and dedication to the commonality of citizens, as Aristotle called it, was profound. It was this polis-citizen bond that made the Greek city-state unlike any other form of state in the ancient world. This fierce loyalty translated into a deep conviction that no persons from outside the state could be allowed to violate its independence. Civic pride was the cement of the polis and was largely responsible for the cultural flowering and sense of kinship of the archaic period. The growing awareness of a shared Greekness, what Herodotus called Hellenikon, or the Greek thing, would culminate in the early 5th century BC when the Greek polis united against the attempts of the Persian Empire to conquer Greece. In the so-called Greco-Persian Wars, the Greeks would equate the freedom of their individual polis with the freedom of all Greeks against the slavery of the Persian tyrant. The shining moment of Panhellenic solidarity would soon fade, however, and for the next century and a half, the polis and the ethne of Greece would continue in their old ways, despite a growing realization among many observers that wars of Greeks against Greeks were tantamount to civil war within a city-state. For most of that period, diplomatic and military activity would center on two great powers. Sparta and Athens. So it is to those who we will turn to next. So join us next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 22, Sparta Ascendant. If you haven't done so yet, please head on over to iTunes and rate and review the show. It would help the podcast grow immensely. Also, while you're there, subscribe to the show so it comes on your phone every week. If you don't have iTunes, you can catch the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play. Also, make sure you're checking out the website at 
thehistoryofancientgreece.com, where I've posted a lot of neat supplementary photos, maps, and charts for each episode. Thanks everyone for your continued support, and I hope you are enjoying the podcast. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled Ode to Orpheus from his album Apollo's Lyre. If you like what you heard and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientlyre.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify.